Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have been traveling through the minor prophets. All We're going to do all 12 of them. And some of you are saying, oh, yay. <laughs> <clears throat> but the minor prophets are, are, they're speaking to a group of people long, long ago, thousands of years ago. But as we found as we go through these, these books, that they could be speaking to us today. I mean, now I've just changed some of the names, changed some of the situations, changed some of the, the, the specific context. But many of the things that the prophets talk about are the same things that we deal with today. Amen. Particularly in a very general, broad uh, situation. And so, we're, we've gone through nine of them. And, and, I'll, and I'll just say this up front, is that we've gone through the nine that are the most, um, uh, what's the word, the most negative. Most of them have been preaching doom and gloom to the people. They're saying, you haven't been faithful to God, and now God is going to bring about some things in your life that are, that are struggles. And so I'm just going to do a really quick little history lesson. It will take, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. And then I'll get into my sermon, okay? So the, the Israel's history, the, what we're talking about with the minor prophets, starts just before 722 B.C. If you do the math in your head, you realize that's all, we're getting close to 3,000 years ago. And just before 722, which is a big date because part of Israel is taken into exile. They are conquered by the Assyrians. And the, the first prophets that we read were telling the people, look out, this is coming. This country is going to come and they're going to judge, bring judgment upon you because you have failed to follow your God. You have failed to keep the covenant with God. And so God is going to bring this to you. And there's, so there's a lot of, we talked about Hosea and Joel and Amos and a lot of the ones that are at the beginning. And they're just constantly coming down on the people. I mean, it's, it's surprising that they even kept the words and put them in the book, right? Because people don't like to hear negative stuff, right? Anybody in here just come to church because you want to be preached at and told how terrible you are and all the destruction? Because that's not, well, that's what's been happening as we go through these. And then from then until 605, oh, it's a little over 100 years, the southern kingdom called Judah is has been told the same thing by another group of prophets. Look at them. See what happened to them in the northern part? That's going to happen to you in the southern part. And there's this constant preaching to these people about there's trouble coming. In the terms of the southern kingdom, it's not Assyria anymore. It's another nation called Babylon. It comes from the same area, but it's a different group of people. And there, and the prophets are saying, look, be faithful to God. Repent. Turn from your sins. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do all of those things and this won't happen. But the people don't really listen. And so the southern kingdom starts to be conquered. And over a period of 20 years, from 605 to 586, these are all B.C., so as time passes, the numbers go down, which is confusing for some of you. But just realize that for 20 years... This Babylon kept coming in, coming through Israel, and gradually people were being taken to Babylon. They were being taken into exile. And then in 586, the, for the Jews, the unthinkable happens. The temple, built by Solomon, a couple of hundred years before that, is destroyed. Completely knocked down. It's gone. The city itself, Jerusalem, the holy city, is burned down. People are taken, finally, 
take it all taken to Babylon. There are still people living there, but a lot of the people have been taken away. And at this point, you have to like kind of put yourself in the minds of the Jews, Israel, and realize God has judged us. God has taken away everything. The significance of the temple, as we're going to see, is that the temple is God's house. That's where God lives. He lives right in the middle of our country. He has the house there. And this is where we go to see God, to seek God, to feel God's presence, to honor God, to worship God. This is every, So the temple is the presence of God in that country and for God's people. And so just think about the, the place, the mental place where these people would be. They're taken out of the land. It looks like God has pretty much given up on us. That's what it kind of looks like. Now they have the words of the prophets that we read because there's a lot of judgment there, but there's also been this, um, the hopeful part of it, which says that once God's done all of these things, he'll begin to rebuild the people. He'll bring them back. He'll, he'll reestablish things. He'll make things better. It's the hope that they bring, the prophets bring. In 538, the Jews begin the return to Israel. And then in 520, the, the prophet that we're going to look at this morning, Haggai, is when he preaches. He's preaching to a bunch of people who have been in exile, who have come back to the city, and now are living with a really uncertain as to about the future. What's God going to do? How is this all going to work? Are we, are we going to be a, our own country again? Or are we going to live under the thumb of these other countries? Are we going to be our own people? Are we going to be able to, to sacrifice to God? Are we going to be able to worship God? Are we going to be able to do all of the things that God wants us to do? I mean, what's going to happen now? So, in, there's, we're going to look at Haggai, but first I want to read several verses from a book called Ezra. Um, this Ezra is one of those people who lived at the time of all these people coming back from this foreign country, Babylon. And it starts with Ezra 1. I'm going to start here with Ezra 1, starting in verse 1. And it says this. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so we got another king, now a different country too. We had the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and now here's the Persians. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem uh, in, Ju in Judah. Cyrus has a pretty much a, what we would today call a God complex. And he really views himself as the most important person in the whole world, everywhere. Nobody's as, nobody's as important to him. He does give a little bit of kind of credit to God by saying, well, God has given me all of this. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any and in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Typical government or president, right? He says to the people, Yes, go build your temple. But I'm not giving you any money. I'm not going to provide anything. You're going to have to do it yourself. But this is the, the interesting thing about this concept is, is that the Persian king gives them permission to go back. Now that's got to be a sign to the Jews that God's with us now. God is on our side. We're going to start returning to all of these things. And turn the page in verse 8 of chapter 3. It says, in the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jezodak, and the rest of the people, 
The priests and the Levites and all who had returned from the captivity in Jerusalem began the work. That's a lot of mouthful of stuff right there. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. And in verse 10 it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love for Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Two years into their return, they laid the foundation. They built an altar. They're starting. Everything's going good. And you're thinking, all right, everything's moving the right way, right? God is with us. We're going we're to go back to what we were before. Everything's going to be great. Yeah, well, let's see. Verse 20, chapter 4, verse 24. It, it's, I'm just reading kind of the summation of this. What happens is, some of the people that had moved into the area while they were gone didn't really like the idea that they were going to rebuild this temple and rebuild the city. They wanted to be a part of it. The Jews said, no, we'll do it ourselves. There was a little bit of disagreement, not like our day, where we all get along and never have any fights and everything. But they had this little disagreement, and they start appealing to back to the king and all this stuff. And then in verse 24 of chapter 4, it says, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. A little bit difficult for sometimes for us to follow, but remember what I said is 538, the Jews began to, and then they start the foundation a couple years later. You know, it's 15 years later when Darius is king. So they stop work. And nothing happens for 15 years. They just stop building. As soon as they have some opposition, they just stop doing the work. The next verse in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josedach, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So at this point, we realize that they get back to work. Why do they get back to work? Because Haggai and Zechariah, the next two prophets we're going to look at, preached and said, it's time to get back to work. And so we're going to look at what Haggai said to make them do this. So, finally, the pastor's getting to his sermon. <laughs> Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. I just stop for a second. Haggai is a fairly short book, but for some reason, he just thinks that you can't, he can't just use the name Zerubbabel or the name Joshua. He has to tell you every single time who, who his father is, where he comes from, and, and even Haggai himself, it's always the prophet Haggai, very rarely. So there's just kind of one of those interesting little ways in which we see the differences between the prophets. He just feels like you got, well, I, I just introduced Zerubbabel, but i got to tell you again who his father was and all this stuff, because otherwise you forget. I don't have to do that, because you guys remember everything I say. <laughs> I say that a lot, by the way. I should stop saying that, because I do say that a lot. I think you do remember some stuff that I say. I think, <laughs> I, I am confident with that, yeah. So Haggai is preaching here to, and, and, and this, the second thing that's really interesting about this is we know exactly the day that Haggai preached this. It says that it's, in the, it's the first day of the sixth month of the second year of King Darius. You know, I know you're just dying to know what day that was, right? It's August 29th, 520 BC. It's weird because he's the only prophet that does this. Every other prophet says, it just says, 
well, during this king's reign, he preached. And there's, you know, 30, 40 years sometimes. But Haggai, we know exactly the day. The first day of the sixth month, second year of King Darius, August 29th, 520 B.C. Isn't that cool? Yeah, you just get on with it, Pastor. Quit bringing up all this other stuff. So it's all good. What we have, though, is the three offices in the Old Testament. We have the king, Zerubbabel, we have the high priest, Joshua, and we have the prophet, Haggai. And those are the three leaders of Israel. All through the Old Testament, those three people, different names, different times, and all that, but those three offices are part of what's going on there. You've got the political guy in the king, you have the religious person in the, um, in the high priest, and then you have the conscience of the state, which is the prophets. The person who stands, kind of stands back a little bit and points out all the things that are going on, whether good or bad. And that's what's going on here. Zerubbabel is the descendant of David. If they had a king, you notice here he's called governor, because technically the Jews aren't their own country. They're under the leadership of another country, so they can't be king. Instead, they call him governor. But they're establishing this, and here we've got the religious leader, and so Haggai's getting, and they're getting, it's like the three parts of our government, you know, you've got the executive branch, and the judicial branch, and the uh, legislation, and you've got, them, you've got them all working together, and it's always really good when, it, when you have all three parts working together, right? Of course, none of us remember that, when that happened, but if, if all three parts are working together, then things really start happening, and that's what's going on with Haggai. He says, this is in verse 2. He says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what... Oh, wait a minute. It got too fast. Is it time for you to just be at your house and ignore the house of God? I'm going to give you a little bit of a insight because when you look at this sometimes and we have a little bit of a, a disconnect because a lot of times you'll hear, you know, it's not, it's not the house that matters. It's not the building that matters. It's the people, right? It's the people. You've heard that before. Anybody ever heard that before? The church is the people, right? So why is God so worried about the building? Because the building at the time represents the place where God resides. So it's in effect, God is saying, how can I live with you all if you won't build me a house? If you won't provide a place for me to be, how can I live with you? Ultimately, this is God's desire. God wants to be with us, his people. And he wants us to provide a place. You get that picture even in the New Testament. You know, you think the Revelation uh, chapter 3 verse 20 says, Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. Just open the door and I'll come in. Isn't that a weird? Why doesn't Jesus just knock the door down, right? Can he keep and do that? But he doesn't. He waits. He wants us to open the door. And he says, I'll come in and we'll eat together and we'll fellowship and we'll just have a really good time together. And that's what God is looking at here with these people. He's saying, build me a house. Build me a, house. Build me a place so that I can be with you. I want to live with you. In the contrast in First Chronicles. We've been reading through, as a church, we've been reading through the Bible in a year. And just recently we went through, we've been going through Chronicles and um, uh, Samuel and some of the other Old Testament histories. And, and so here's Haggai saying, you're living in these, your own paneled houses and my house is in ruins. That's what he says to them. We've got to change that. But if we go back to First Chronicles, we have a guy named David. Remember David? He was, he's the king of Israel, basically. And he, at a point in his time, says, 
After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. Notice the similarities between the two. David says, David recognizes, I have this house, but God, I need to build a house for God. Haggai says to the people, you have your houses, you need to build a house for God. And at this point in the story, both prophets are, are on board with this. Nathan says, yes, David, go do it. And then he goes to bed that night, God gives him a vision, he gives up the next morning, and he goes back to David, and he says, David, don't do it. Because there is a time to do these kinds of things. Doesn't mean that God doesn't want a house. He just says that David's not the one who's going to do it. Instead, it's going to be his son Solomon. But Haggai goes, same situation. Same issue. God wants to live with his people. God wants to be with us. And that's what he's talking about here. And so we have this it, it is a little bit difficult sometimes because God at one point says to people, nope, not time to build. Then he turns around and says to another group of people, yep, it's time for building. And sometimes it's kind of a struggle to know how or who is supposed to do what. The point isn't so much individuals. The point is as a body of Christ. Together, we are to provide a place for God. We are to establish this uh, as a um, as a place where God can work through us, that God can work in us, that God can speak to the world at wide because He's here with us in to, when we gather together. The New Testament, as we're going to see in a second, focuses more on it is the people because we are the presence of Christ. We are the ones who represent God to the world. So God lives in us and through us and focuses outward and through who we are and what we do. In 1 Corinthians uh, verse 12, or chapter 12, there's a, a verse about, about God's dwelling in us, starting in verse 4. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So wherever we go, whatever we're doing, each on our own individual basis, we are showing that God lives with us through the things that we do in this world. Whether it's leading music or teaching the kids, or when we're in the world, helping, uh, helping the poor, helping our neighbor, working through whatever. We are, it's God working through us. And when we realize that, we see ourselves then as the dwelling place of God. It's important for us to think of, those, of our lives as being a manifestation of who God is. That wherever I go, Whatever I do, because God dwells in me and in us, we are serving God. We're all going to be in a different place. All the way through the week, some of you, well, some of you won't even be in this town. You'll be back home. Some of you will be uh, at work. Some of you will be at home. Some of you will be helping a neighbor. Some of us, wherever, the point is God is dwelling with his people, and that is carried with us wherever we go. And whatever we do. It's a change from Jerusalem and the temple back in Haggai's time to our time. But at that time, Haggai says, we need to show the world that we believe that our God dwells with us. And we do that by building a temple. We do that by focusing on what's going on with us as a group and not on each on our individual basis all in our own homes, taking care of our own business. No, when we're out in the world, we're all representing Christ. And we have to uh, keep that in mind. So why weren't the people building the temple 
or what was what was the result of the fact that people were were building the temple? In Haggai chapter one verse five it says, "Now this is what the Lord Almighty says: Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages." only to put them in a purse with holes in it. They were looking around at the people, Haggai's looking at them and saying, you realize that it's been 15 years since you came back. And when you came back, you really had this high expectation that everything was going to be good. Everything was going to be positive. So how come it's not? How come you're struggling? How come it doesn't seem like God is with us or with you? Part of it is because you're not focused on what God wants. It's one of the messages of the prophets over and over again. When we go through trials, when we go through struggles, what's going on really is God is saying, you need to wake up. You need to pay attention to who is responsible for all these things. Mm-hmm. You, you just need to, that's what those, that's what those things do. Every time we go through a trial, or whatever time we hear somebody uh, going through a, a surgery or having a disease, or have, well, it's not supposed to be necessarily just thinking, oh, well, God's judging me. It's, we really need God to be in our lives to help us. That's what those things do, or are supposed to do. Now, what happens a lot of times is we say, no, it's obviously God's mad at me, so why would I do anything with God or for God? But God's trying to get us to go the other direction and say, no, we need God. We need God to dwell with us. We need to do what we should do so that we can dwell. I mean, we are talked about the um, the promises of God. If we turn back a page from Haggai, last week we did Zephaniah. Remember Zephaniah? Somebody stand up and tell them. I'm just talking about Zephaniah. <laughs> but Zephaniah has this thing right towards the end of his book where he's talking about judgment is going to come on Judah. But after that, I'm going to bring the people back, and this is what God promises. The last verse of Zephaniah uh, 3.20, it says, At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. And Haggai says to the people, why isn't that happening? God, well, God said it would happen. Why isn't it happening? And Haggai says, the reason, as we're going to see, is that you're not honoring God. You're actually going back to all the things that the, your, uh, your ancestors were doing, and you're going to go, you're going down the same road. God says, I, I want to be with you, but you've you, you got to provide a place. You've got to build a place for me to be. You gotta make room for me in your lives. And a lot of the people would be looking back and saying, like Zephaniah said, didn't Zephaniah say that everything was gonna be great, it was gonna be restored, everything, all the fortunes were gonna everything was gonna be perfect, we're gonna have everything we need, other people are gonna praise us. Is it how come that's not happening? How come it's not going on? And that's what Haggai says. Back to Haggai verse 7. It says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of... Of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God says, you're not honoring me, so why would I provide for you? Why would I give answers to your prayers? Why would I keep my word when you're not keeping your word? be nice if we could just, at this point I would just say, yes, this is something that has changed and God doesn't act this way anymore, but it's one of the things that we do a lot is pray for our country, 
And we ask God, you know, to fix the problems. Make the economy better. Make their, so there's less divisions. Bring peace. Bring unity. And God says, well, how am I going to do that if the people aren't honoring me? How am I going to do that if they're not making a place for me? How can I answer those prayers if the people themselves aren't turning to God? And that's the measure. That's what we see. That's what we see in Haggai to talking to those people. That's what God says to us. You would think with the number of people in church right now and the number of people who are praying for the health of this country, that this country, God would just say, oh, God, look at all those prayers. I'll just answer those prayers. But then he looks at the whole country and realizes, I can't answer those prayers. Because it requires the people to make a dwelling for me, to receive me, to follow me, to put their faith in me. And that's what God is saying. So what's going to happen to the people in Israel? In, in this in Israel, and the answer is this, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, there's the names again, see, he, every time he's got to just giggle through the whole list, the high priest, and then he says the whole remnant of the people, the remnant is a by, a, a by word, a catch word, when you see remnant, that's, a, that's actually a good thing. These are people that are turning to God. Remember earlier when he was talking to him, he said, this is what the Lord Almighty says, these people say. And now, Haggai says, of the remnant. And that, so that's a good thing. The remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai. We don't want to forget Haggai's a prophet. Again, he's going to keep reminding us, I'm a prophet. Because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. In uh, verse 13, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Haggai is the best preacher ever. He preaches to the people and they immediately, they all respond. It's a, that's a preacher's dream, right? <laughs> you, you preach a sermon and everybody just gets excited and they pick up and then they just go do the, the work, right? That's what, that's, what, that's what he does here. So Haggai is pretty impressed with himself. Except that, notice that it just doesn't, it wasn't Haggai's preaching that did it. It was God who did it. God stirred up the spirit of the king. God stirred up the spirit of the priest. God stirred up the spirit. God used Haggai to get people to change. And that's the, that's the goal, really, of preaching. I can't ever take credit for anything that you guys do because I say something. Because it's just God speaking to me, through me, to you. I just happen to be the one that God's using. He could use somebody else. He could use a book. He could use a song you hear on the radio. He could sing. He could use a lot of things. But sometimes, God uses a preacher. <laughs> and this is what happens to Haggai. And the people go back to work. It's a, man, it's a, this whole book is, it all happens within a couple of months. It's actually going to be five or six years for them to rebuild the temple completely. This is just the start. This is just the beginning of the whole thing. So, in chapter 2, verse 1, Haggai says, It's in the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month. And, and I know you guys are keeping track and you're writing down, okay, this is the second year, the sixth month, this is the seventh month. So this is about a month later. And I know that some of you are waiting for this, but this would be October 17th, 520 B.C. You should be writing that down. That's the most important thing I'm going to say today. Is that I just think it's really interesting that Haggai gets so specific about the time and the day. He, the only reason he doesn't say 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock in the morning is because nobody at that time had wristwatches and clocks. Nobody knew what time it was. So it's just the day. Haggai preaches again a month later. And this is what he says. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to 
Zerubbabel, Joshua, and to the remnant of the people. See, I, and after a while, you get tired of it. Why do you keep telling us this thing? That we know that. We heard all this, right? <laughs> Ask them, Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people, who of you who is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So they start to work. It's been 15 years. They lay out the foundation. They start building up the walls. And there were some of the people there who remember Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple is one of the seven wonders of the world. It's an amazing place, apparently. Gold everywhere, big, uh, big nice stones, everything. And they're looking at this foundation and thinking, it's kind of pitiful, isn't it? Like, look, at, look at this. We're building this. It's not going like that. And God has to tell people, no, look, be strong. Stay the course. Do what needs to be done. I have to be honest, sometimes that's, uh, this is the, the, the difficult thing in a pastor's life. I preach to this tiny little church in this tiny little town out in the middle of nowhere on the coast and think, wow, it'd be nice if there were, you know, a thousand people listening to me preach. There were... But it doesn't matter about the size of the work. The question is going to be, is God there? Twice in here, or twice in this few verses, God says, I am with you. I am with you. Ultimately, that's what matters. Is God in it? If God is in it, then it doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't, don't compare it to something else or what else is going on in a different church. There are other churches, even in this area, that are bigger than this. But it doesn't matter, because I think God is in it. God is working. He's working in you. Amen. Amen. One, one of you, anyway. He's working in you. <laughs> I, I, have to, I, I just have to be confident in that. Even, even when I see Bill, I think God can't be working on that. <laughs> really? No, he is. Even in the few years I've known him, you can see the growth. You can see God working in him. You hear it whenever he shares. That this is, this is the, the issue here is not how big it is or how, uh, how good the building is or how many people are coming. The point is, is God in it? Can, can we really confidently say that God says, I am with you? Yes. That's our goal. Yes. That was a rhetorical question, but thank you for answering that. <laughs> yeah. In verse 6 it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Don't worry about the signs. Ask the question. Is God getting the glory because of what's going on here? Is God praised? Whenever you see the glory of God, a lot of times we think of maybe praise, or we even think about God you know, shining or something like that. But the glory of God is always about His presence. Is he here? And that's what really, when we say, I'm going to give glory to God, that's really what you're doing. You're pointing out that God is working. God's here. He's doing something. And that's what giving glory to God means. Pointing out his presence. He's working in your life. He's working in my life. He's working in us together. This is my prayer, by the way, is that, that people outside this church, when they think about our church, that's what they think about. God's there. God is in those people. 
That's, that's our goal. We want people to think that. So, God's goal in all things is that He would dwell with His people so that He would receive the glory. That's, our, that's what our purpose is. We go out into the world and do the things we do, and then give God the glory. That's God who did that. That's God who helped my neighbor mow his lawn. That's God who helped feed the hungry in that situation. That's God who helped pay somebody's rent. That's God who just gave somebody some encouragement when they went through a tough time. That's God doing that. I'm doing it too, but God's doing it through me. That's not, that should be our attitude. That's our goal. That's our mission. That's our calling. That people would see us as representatives of God. And that they would see God in everything that we do. We set aside our own feelings. Sometimes we look at think, ah, what I'm doing is not that. It doesn't seem like that much. What we're doing doesn't seem like it's a whole making a big impact. But that's not the question. The question is, is God getting the glory? Is God shaking things up through what we do? We have a mission statement at our church. How many of you knew that? You should know it because I think it's on the front of the it's on the front of the bulletin. But I, and I know you guys all read the bulletin cover to cover every. But anyway, be that as it may. But the, a few years ago when we put this together, I wanted to make sure that the first line was the the line that it is now. So our mission statement is is that First Community Church will together give glory to God. Bring others to Jesus and show love to our community. But the first line is the most important one. Whatever else we do, God gets the glory. God gets the praise. God gets the focus from other people. It's not about me. It's a reminder that even when I'm not doing being the best person I could be, that God is still getting blamed for that. That's a whole different sermon, though, so we're not going to go down there. But we want God to get the glory. That's our mission as a church. Let's pray.